So I am going to be talking about PageSpeed, um, which is a web server plugin. So it runs inside Apache as well as PageSpeed. Um, it also now runs inside Nginx. Um, and then people in the community have ported it to uh, Microsoft IIS, to Apache Traffic Server, and very recently to Open Lightspeed. Um, so you can, you can run it on uh, most of the things out there. And if you'd like to port it to something else, I would, I would love to talk to you. It's all open source. So Mod PageSpeed does its optimization on the fly, which means that a request comes in to the web server, and then the web server optimizes it in the background. And then the first request is usually not optimized, because we don't want to delay that response. We want to send something out as quickly as possible, because we want things to be fast. Um, but we can, cache our, we can cache our optimizations, and then later responses are optimized. Um, so generally, Pages get loaded many, many times, so that first request doesn't matter too much. Um, and uh, you don't have to know in advance everything that's going to be on your site in order to run Mod PageSpeed. You can just turn it on, and it can sort of discover the stuff that's going through your server and optimize. Um, so what kind of optimizations do we do? So we might have a web page, um, and it's got a JavaScript file on it. And if we fetch this JavaScript file, and we look for the cache control header, uh, we see that it's 300 seconds. So this is a pretty common default configuration. The web server is saying to browsers that if they need this file again within 300 seconds, then that's fine. Otherwise, they have to re-request it. So there's a trade-off with cache control. With traditional cache control headers, you balance speed and freshness. So if you have a short cache lifetime, you can push <coughs> updated content really fast. You can say you can make a change to your JavaScript file, and your users will see it very quickly. Um, alternatively, if you have a long cache lifetime, then pages load faster because uh, browsers are more likely to already have the thing in cache and they don't have to go fetch it. So this is just sort of a standard trade-off you have anytime you're using HTTP caching headers. And the solution to this is to say, like, okay, well, HTTP caching headers are cool, but really what we need is long caching. So if we use very long cache lifetimes combined with changing the URL whenever the content changes, then we don't have this trade-off anymore. Um, because if we make a change server-side, then we also change the URL. So this is kind of annoying to do manually, though. Every time you change your JavaScript file, you have to find everywhere that references it and update it and do this for every resource on your site. Like, people do this, and you can build systems to do it, but this is something PHP can just do for you. So in this case, our main.js, our JavaScript file, now has this like, nice, long, ugly name. But the important thing is that it has a hash in it. So this is a hash of the content. So if the file were to change on disk, we would have a new hash. And um, because it has this hash, we can serve it with a long cache lifetime. So here we fetch it, and we uh, look for the cache control header. And we see, yes, it has a nice long cache lifetime. That's a year in seconds, which in terms of browser caches is basically forever, because caches don't really stay around that long. So the content changes, the hash changes. So let's try this. So we, we send something to that file. And we fetch it, and hold on, the hash didn't change. That's the same hash we saw before, so I screwed something up. Um, oh, we added a comment to the file. And PageSpeed strips out comments, and the hash is of the optimized version. So the hash is not going to change. So okay, so we put some real JavaScript in the file, we, and we send it out. This is not going to get stripped out, because it's real. Um, and we do see a different hash now. You can see, yeah, different hash. So, okay, so what else can we do automatically to sites with like no configuration? You install our module, what do you get? So, I mean, like as much as possible. So, uh, we can combine CSS files. So, if we have a page that has like three CSS files, um, that would be multiple round trips. So, if we, so for example, like, so uh, here's a key. Okay, so here's a fetch of that page with um, those three CSS files. So, the first request is for the index page, and then we have requests for each of the three CSS files. And um, you can see that they're being loaded partially in parallel, partially not. The browser has to open multiple connections, and it's kind of slow. Um, so we can combine them into one CSS file. And now we're only using one connection. Now if, you're now, if your page only has these three CSS files and the HTML, it doesn't matter very much. But often in downloading things, the number of parallel connections you have to a site is a bit of a bottleneck. And also, when you download things, um, if you look at this, you know how it, I, I show that um, content download time is in blue, and time to first byte time is in green. So time to first byte time is when we're waiting for the origin server to give us our content. 
content download is it started giving us our content and we're waiting for the rest of it. And you can see there's actually no, like the content download isn't even visible. It's all waiting for the origin server. And this is pretty typical for small text files, um, like this CSS file. It takes effectively no time to transfer the bytes. And almost all of the time, as you ask to the server, it has to go all the way out there, it has to come all the way back, and um, then you start getting any content at all. Um, what this means is when you concatenate things into one file, like if you look in the second one here, there's still no time transferring the bytes, but we only have to wait for that round trip once. Um, so there's huge savings when you do that. Um, and CSS is often blocking the render. We don't show anything on the page until we have all the CSS. So it's really important to make this more efficient. Okay, so let's go back. So we have these three CSS files, and PageSpeed sees them, and it just turns them into one concatenated CSS file. Um, and it's not quite just one concatenated CSS file. It has to do some more complicated stuff. For example, imagine, uh, I don't know, imagine that blue file ends with an open curly brace. Well, that'll actually work fine in browsers. Like, it won't cause a problem because it's at the end of the CSS file and they didn't need it after that. But if you blindly concatenated the three of them, it would just ruin all of her styles for the later ones. Uh, so we actually have to look over them and verify them um, and, and make sure that we're not going to be introducing problems when we do this. Um, and, and many things that do CSS combining sort of naively, like if you tried to do it yourself, uh, you'd, you'd have to figure that out somehow. I mean, it's your own site, so you can probably say, oh, this broke my site, I'll fix my CSS file, which is less of an option when you're doing things totally automatically, hands on. Okay. We can also do the same thing with JavaScript files. We can have these two JavaScript files, and we can combine them. So we have a source, and then we eval one, and we eval the other. And again, we're doing that in case there are errors in one of them that would then screw up the interpretation of the other one. Um, so, and then we have minification, we can take our CSS, we can make it a lot smaller. And JavaScript, we can take our JavaScript, we can make it a lot smaller. We can inline things. So if you have small external resources, um, why have that round trip to go get it and come back? Um, yes, if you do that, you can put it in cache, but if it's small enough, that's not a very good trade-off. The main reason people don't inline things is it's kind of annoying to do manually. But we can do it for you. So that CSS file, really simple. They're all simple, and we can just inline them. Uh, we can also, so we can optimize the images. Um, you have lots of images on a site. That's often most of the bytes transferred in a site, so there's quite a bit of room for improving bandwidth by improving the images. Yeah, lots to fix here. So one problem is people sometimes resize images in HTML. So like you've got HTML, it says, here's an image, it's this wide, it's this tall. And that works fine. The browser can download the image and resize it to whatever that is. Um, but if the image turns out to actually be much larger than that, uh, that's very wasteful. And, and you might see this, like you'll see a site and it's got like pictures of the people who work at the company and they're all loading very slowly and it's just because they took a full size thing from a camera and they resize in HTML. So yeah, this is a hundred times larger than it needs to be. We can make it much better. Um, we can uh, resize it automatically, we can detect the situation and just fix it for you. Uh, similarly, some images are not compressed very well. Um, so if we have one large image, uh, and we fetch it, this is what it might look like if it comes straight out of the camera. So it's a JPEG, but it's a JPEG at something like 98 quality, which is much better than makes any sense for the web, especially if it's a large image. Um, page speed can optimize it. It can um, convert it to a lower quality level, like 85 is the default. It can um, remove... Um, metadata. Uh, yeah, metadata and other sort of redundant stuff inside the, um, inside the image. Um, and it can make it much smaller. In this case, it made it 63% smaller, which is pretty cool. Um, and visually, I checked these, and it looked, I couldn't tell the difference on my screen, which is a retina screen, so that's pretty good. Um, but this is a very large image. Um, okay. So also, sometimes people do photographs as PNG, which you shouldn't do. You should use PNG for um, uh, text. You should use it for screenshots. You should use it for computer-generated images. But photographs are very well compressed by JPEG. Um, and so if we have a photo that's been stored as a PNG, and we fetch it, we see it's huge, and PageSpeed will, will look at it, it will realize this is a photographic PNG, and it will convert it to JPEG. If it's not a photographic PNG, it will leave it as PNG. Uh, it can detect this. Um, and so if we fetch it, we see it's much smaller. Um, 16 times smaller, in fact. Okay. Also, WebP is really cool, it's really small, but not all browsers support it. So we would like to serve WebP to browsers that support it, and we would like to serve JPEG to browsers that don't support WebP. So if we have a JPEG here, 
Um, this is the optimized version of the JPEG that PHP has. Um, and if we fetch it, it's medium sized. If we fetch it again from a browser that supports WebP, PHP will notice that, and it'll make it much smaller. So this is not as big an improvement as some of our others, because JPEG is still very good, but it's enough that it's worth doing. So these have all been our, the automizations, these are the optimizations that we can do completely automatically. Just like you install mod PHP, you get the optimizations. So we can extend cache, we can combine CSS files and JavaScript files, we can minify the files, we can inline small external resources, <coughs> we can optimize the images. All of this is automatic. And actually, there are a whole lot of other smaller fixes that I didn't get into. Um, there, uh, like we can take, um, if, you have a meta, if you have a meta tag at the top of the page, we can convert that to a header. Um, which is good for old versions of IE. There are lots and lots of little things like that that we do, um, but most of them are not as powerful at speeding up sites as, as this list. Um, these are our big ones. So, okay, so this is sort of, if you install the module, you get the optimizations, um, it's pretty good. Um, but you guys are here because you care a lot about speed, maybe you're willing to put in some effort to configure it to actually get more of an improvement for your site. So we could take the JavaScript that is blocking rendering, and we can leave it for later. We can figure out what CSS is actually being used, and we could inline just that. Uh, we could take the images and lazy load them. We could sprite our images, which is kind of like um, combined CSS and JavaScript, but for images. Um, and we could run experiments to find exactly what's right for your site. So before we get into that, though, we should look at a little bit of just tuning your page, uh, tu tuning your page speed install. So, um, Mod PageSpeed is capable of giving you messages, so it can say like, hey, I'm having a problem with this. Um, and it will work without that, but it won't sort of work as effectively as it could. Um, so if you load it up and you go to the admin console, you have to turn on the admin console, you go there, you see the message history, well, and first it complains because uh, you haven't actually told it that it should save its messages. For efficiency, it doesn't actually save its messages by default. So, okay, so we go into the configuration, we set our message buffer size to store some messages, um, and now we go back. Okay. Now we have some messages. So it turns things colors so you can see what's important. Um, in general, info messages are useful if you're trying to debug something hairy, but mo don't represent problems. Um, but errors and warnings do represent problems. Um, and in this case, we have a warning because I flushed the cache, which would be useful if I were debugging things, but doesn't actually a problem. And we have an error because I, for testing purposes, gave it a bogus uh, log file name for, this, for the statistics file. Um, this doesn't exist, um, and so it's going to give an error about it. Um, and on a, on a site that was configured badly, you might have other errors, like it's not capable of fetching your resources um, because they're over HTTPS and um, that needs to be configured or something. Um, so um, another way you can do this is you can turn on the debug filter. Um, so this tells PageSpeed, as it's processing your HTML, if it finds something interesting, it puts in a comment and tells you. So here we have um, a page. In this page, we have an image of some mice singing. And um, we have it injecting two comments there in green that sort of are, so uh, I talked earlier about how we could resize um, images to make them fit the size they're going to be in HTML. And it looked at this and it saw, OK, that doesn't apply here, so put in a comment. If we're trying to understand why it didn't apply, it might be useful to see a comment like this. And similarly, it says it didn't inline it because it's too many bytes. If you disagreed with it, you could raise your inlining threshold, um, or you could um, agree with it and say, okay, you're right. This image is too big. We shouldn't inline it. Um, and in this case, I think it's right. It should not be inlined. Yes? Yeah? Is the source set a new feature that you guys added? Um, the source set actually, um, no, that's just something that was in the page. Gotcha. Um, just to and you'll to also check. notice that um, the image source is optimized. And actually, the source set is not optimized. So the source set has not been converted to WebP. It's not been cache extended. Uh, PageSpeed hasn't touched it. Um, that's something that we need to work on. Uh, we need to be able to pull out the URLs and source sets um, and optimize them like any other image URL. Okay. Um, we'll do that sometime. All right. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, this just has a source set because that's what the page has. Um, OK, so this is the basics for your site. Um, but we want to make it faster. Okay. So I talked earlier about deferring JavaScript. So we can, um, when you want to test out a filter on PageSpeed, uh, we can take the URL and we can append this query parameter, PageSpeed filters, and we can say, uh, we can set it to plus defer JavaScript, which turns on the JavaScript filter, or this defer JavaScript filter. 
Um, and so the, the problem with JavaScript is it's really cool, but it blocks rendering. So if you're using your JavaScript for progressive enhancement, so it's not like necessary for the view of the page, but it's useful if you have it, which is sort of a standard way to recommend people install JavaScript. If you're using JavaScript like this, you kind of like to load everything on your page and then load the JavaScript. Um, and your page will load much faster because you're not waiting for the JavaScript. So if we have a page that currently begins by loading some jQuery, and then it has an autocomplete script that depends on jQuery, and then has lots of visually important page content, which you really would like to show up uh, before having to go fetch jQuery or autocomplete. Um, and uh, then what PageSpeed can do is PageSpeed can uh, look at the page, it can take all the JavaScript, and it can change the type of the JavaScript. It sets it to text PSAJS. The browser sees this. It says, I have no idea what text PSAJS is, and it ignores the script block. So all of your script blocks, um, the, scripts won't get, the scripts won't get fetched, they're just completely ignored. And um, then the whole page will load. And then at the end, uh, PageSpeed will include a defer JavaScript script. And what this will do is this will go over all of the scripts on the page and then run them. And to do this, it has to set up like an artificial execution environment to deal with things like document.write. Because normally, if you do document.write in a different time, it has a very different effect. Um, and so the downside of all of this is this can break pages. Um, so you want to look at it and make sure it's a good fit for your page. But also you want to make sure you don't defer JavaScript that's useful for rendering. So if you, if you have a page that doesn't use JavaScript for progressive enhancement, and instead, the whole page is rendered in JavaScript. Like, if you don't have JavaScript, there's no point in loading this page. Like Gmail, for example. It's all in JavaScript. You wouldn't want to defer that, because if you deferred it, it would just load nothing, and then load the JavaScript slowly, because, or slower, because it's in an artificial execution environment. So this is why we don't have it on by default, both because sometimes it breaks pages, because it has to do hairy things with JavaScript, and also because sometimes pages are using JavaScript as sort of a critical part of the rendering path. Um, and you don't want to defer that. That won't speed things up. So you, you um, check that you're not using JavaScript for rendering. Uh, you check for breakage. And then you can turn on defer JavaScript. And this is one of our most powerful filters in terms of how much it speeds up sites. Yes? Is there any way to, to specify these are you know, progressively enhanced JavaScript uh, sources versus critical path JS sources? Sure. So you could do it on a page by page level. You can mark some pages have deferred JavaScript, some pages don't. And within a page, you can say, don't defer this JavaScript by adding, I think it's page speed no defer uh, as, an, as an argument on it. Um, this is all documented on our deferred JavaScript page. Okay. Um, and it's, that's fine, but you do have to make sure you also mark all of its dependencies as don't defer. Right. Like right. If, if jQuery is large and at the beginning of your document and most of the things can be deferred, but you have something that depends on jQuery, don't defer jQuery. Okay. We also can prioritize the critical CSS. So, you turn it on just like all the other things. And what it does is it removes CSS that isn't necessary for the page. So many sites have like one CSS file which they use across their whole site. And it doesn't have that much that's specific to each page. But if we get just what's specific to the page, we might be able to make it small enough that we can profitably inline it. And then we'd like to do that because then we can avoid that round trip. Um, so yeah, so it inlines the page specific CSS as opposed to all of your CSS. So if we have um, HTML, it includes a reference to site.css, which has uh, some stuff about how to display headers, and content, and footers. And it's got a buy button that only appears on the purchase page, and a sidebar that appears on some of the pages, but not all the pages. And it's got contact information, which is really only on the contact page and the About Us page. And then it's got something for displaying menus, and it's got like a password form if you're resetting your password. And it turns out that, like, say a given page only needs four of these. Um, and they're also relatively light. Well, so instead of referencing them in external CSS, we can inline them, just like one inline style block. And um, this can speed up rendering by avoiding that external round trip by making it small enough to inline. So one question is, though, how does PageSpeed actually know what CSS is necessary and what isn't? That's not normally something you can just tell. Um, so we tried doing this with static analysis. It turns out web pages are just really hard to understand. And like something can look unused, and some JavaScript can make it be used. So pretty much the only way to find out what's actually used is you have to ask the web browser. So we use JavaScript beaconing. So what happens is we put a little bit of JavaScript at the end of the page that runs after everything is rendered, that uh, looks over the page and sees which of your CSS selectors actually got used. And it beacons that back. 
And then we collect that for um, many different uh, responses on different browsers and different screen sizes and different situations. And we learn what CSS selectors are necessary for what page. And that lets us figure out which ones to inline. So if you try this, you like it, you can enable prioritize critical CSS in your config file. We can also lazy load images. Um, so we turn this on the same way. Um, we want our above the fold images to be loaded normally. But we want our below the fold images to get loaded when someone uh, scrolls down to them or just on the onload so that we have them ready. Um, and this isn't something that like you might think, oh, well, maybe browsers should just do this. Browsers should not load images until they're visible in the viewport. The problem is if a browser does this, it doesn't know which images are going to be above the fold because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't fully know where everything is going to go until it gets pretty far along in the rendering process. So if it waited to, sh if it waited to load an image until it was sure it was going to be visible, uh, that would slow down pages. So what we do is uh, we figure out what's above the fold with more of this JavaScript beaconing. And then if we have a page that has an image on it and more page content than another image. So image A is above the fold, image B is below the fold. Um, we can change this to, uh, we can put um, a, uh, an identifier on this because we can't trust that things have IDs and we can't insert IDs without breaking pages. Um, and we can put a little onload handler that uh, checks to see if this image is, is above the fold, uh, critical, uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, and similarly, we would do this for um, B. So in this case, though, these two uh, calls to check image for criticality are going to do different things. Uh, on A, it's going to say, yes, this is visible for most users. It'll say, this is visible. And B is going to say, for most users, this is not visible. So page people learn to treat these differently. So in the case of B, um, we can see that, so first we had b.jpg, and then PageSpeed turned that into, okay, check it for criticality. And then after it's collected enough stuff, now it can say, okay, I'm going to start sending it a different way. I'm going to say, PageSpeed lazy source is the original source, and I still have this hash, so I can keep track of what it is. And then its actual source is this random GIF, and this is um, a one-by-one one spacer GIF, and all your images on the page that are being lazy loaded will be the same one-by-one one spacer GIF. And then onload, we would actually load this thing, if visible, um, or wait for later. OK. Um, so this lets us display images um, that, uh, if the image is, needs to be visible right away, we show it right away. If it's not visible right away, we leave it. OK. And you can turn it on the same way. So spriting images um, is one of sort of a pretty, it's kind of annoying to do manually. Um, <laughs> but we can do it automatic. Well, not entirely automatically. So, Spriting images has, there are a bunch of limitations because browsers don't let you just say image source equals take this image and crop it to here and show that. Um, that's not something that is supported in browsers, so you have to use CSS. And PageSpeed doesn't deal with the converting your image to the CSS version of it, uh, but it'll do the stuff after that. So um, briefly, so it does the annoying bit where you have to mess around with concatenating images and calculating the offsets. Okay. So um, it works on GIFs and pings because those are most of the ones that people want to sprite. Um, and we had to write image format specific code to do this. Um, and yes, it's CSS backgrounds only. It also requires an explicit width and height that it's able to find um, because uh, interpreting this through CSS rule inheritance can get really complicated. Okay. So imagine we have this little demo. This is a page I made. It has two images on it. They're arrows. They're links. So, the source of this page looks like this. We have, we have a left arrow and a right arrow, and they are both links to different pages. Um, by right now, if we turned on sprite images, it would do nothing. It would say, it might leave us an HTML comment saying, I can't do this because these are images, um, as opposed to background images. Um, but it would do nothing. So if we first uh, get rid of the image tag and set IDs so we can talk about them in CSS, and then make them inline blocks, so that's like an image tag, and then um, set a background URL for them, and set explicit width. Now we've got the same view as we had before, um, but we've done it through CSS. So now it's ready to be separated. And if we give this to PageSpeed, um, then on one, so before we have left and right PNG. Afterwards, we have the same PNG, right plus left, right plus left. And they're positioned at um, 0, 0, and 0, negative 100. Um, so this has dealt with the concatenation part, 
and it's dealt with the cropping and offset part. Um, which means that now, if you later need, realize you need to make a change to something, you can just change that image file on disk, and everything will work fine. Um, you don't have to regenerate your sprites, um, which I hope you weren't doing by hand, because that's super annoying. Um, so yeah, so you can turn on sprite images. So the thing is, though, what's good for one site is not necessarily good for other sites. So like, is prioritizing critical CSS a good fit for your site? Or did that turn out to be inlining too much and actually slow things down? What should your inlining thresholds be? Um, do lower quality images lower conversions? Like, yes, they speed up the site, but maybe if you have ugly pictures of the products you're trying to sell, no one wants to buy things anymore. Um, so <coughs> PageSpeed lets you, um, PageSpeed lets you uh, run experiments on things like this. So in the config file, you can turn on the experiment framework, and you have to give it an ID for a Google Analytics account to report to. Um, and then you can start defining experiments. So here we have, so half the people, that's 50%, should get the default situation. So however PageSpeed is normally configured. And then the other 50% will get the default, plus they'll also get the prioritized critical CSS filter. So this is an experiment to see if I turn on prioritized critical CSS, what happens? Um, so if someone visits the page, they'll randomly be assigned uh, to one of, the two one of the two sides of the experiment. So maybe they're in group one. Uh, then we'll set a cookie so that on repeated views of the page they'll get the same version because otherwise we'd have problems with like, um, imagine we're testing the value of cache extension. If we switch people between the two groups, um, they won't have the same things in their cache. Um, so we, we want people to be having a consistent experience. Um, so we need cookies to do this. So we have a cookie called PageSpeed Experiment. Um, in this case, the coin came up heads, so it's one. Um, and we remember what group they're in. We show the page with the default optimizations and we um, log to Google Analytics in JavaScript that we want um, these to be grouped in with one-sided experiment. And then other people flip the coin the other way, they get experiment two, um, prioritize critical CSS runs, and we log them on the other side. Okay, so this logs all to Google Analytics, and they're in, so, and it's all on the basis of a custom variable. And then in Google Analytics, you can compare anything that Google Analytics measures broken down by the status of this custom variable. Um, so you can look at page load time, which would be pretty good to do for prioritized critical CSS. Uh, you can look at bounce rate, um, which is maybe more what you care about with something like this. Or you could look at the impact on conversions. Um, if you're making small improvements and you have very few conversions, uh, you're not going to be able to do a meaningful experiment on conversions. Uh, like if I have 10 conversions a week, so they're going to get split into 5 and 5 approximately. Um, it's going to take me like months and months before I can make any sort of real statistical claims about that. So you kind of, so unless you're sort of big, you can't really use conversions even though it's what you care about. So you'll have to use something a little farther up the funnel, like maybe how far they get through your site, or, um, or just page load time, which you think is probably a reasonably good proxy for their experience. Um, so you can, with this, you can find out what is actually a good fit for your site, um, and you can tune it appropriately. Yeah. So, PageSpeed does these automatic baseline optimizations, the sort of thing that like, we kind of wish every site would have, but one major reason they don't is it's annoying to do manually, um, and PageSpeed can do it for you. You just turn on PageSpeed, you get it. And then it's also a powerful configurable tool. Um, many of the changes you might want to make to websites in the name of speed, we have a filter for. Uh, it might take a little bit of configuration. For example, you can have PageSpeed take all your URLs and map them onto a CDN. So you sign up for the CDN, you set it up to fetch content from your site, and we can take your resources, rewrite them, and then make the URLs point to your CDN. Um, and that will all just work. Um, but you'd have to use, you'd have to um, make some changes to the configuration file for that to work. Um, so some resources for doing this. So we have pretty extensive documentation um, on the Google website. Um, all of these filters I talked about have pages where they talk about um, what configuration options there are, risks, benefits. Um, and uh, especially for the more complicated filters like Defer JavaScript and Prioritize Critical CSS, it's really worth reading um, the documentation. Um, we also have a mailing list where if you read the documentation and you have questions, you should post to it. Uh, in fact, if you have questions that haven't read the documentation, it's still okay if you post to it. We'll answer it anyway. Um, we try to be friendly. Um, and then we have an announcements list. If you're running Mod PageSpeed and you want to know when we have new versions or security releases or whatever, you should subscribe to the announcements list. Discuss is sort of medium traffic. We've got a few messages a day. Uh, announce is very low traffic. We've got messages every few months, so it's pretty safe to subscribe to. All right, so questions? 
Yes. One of the earlier things that you were mentioning is the automatic conversion of PNGs into JPEGs. Yeah. If PageSpeed detects that it's a photographic image. Yes. How do you guys do that? So uh, we have a heuristic. Um, it was developed by an image processing guy who works on the team. Um, I don't actually remember what the heuristic is. Mm -hmm. I think it's something about like looking for really, really straight lines, mm. which appear in almost never in real life and most of the time in anything that is a graphic. Right. Um, but uh, I should probably ask him to write up a blog post on this because it's pretty cool. Okay. Um, does PageSpeed work with any other JPEG formats, JPEG XR, JPEG 2000, or is it just WebP uh, right it now? Works in, it works with JPEG formats that are supported widely in browsers. WebP is um, only supported in Chroma. Well, WebP is not a JPEG format. Well, it's also supported in Opera. But yeah, yeah. No, um, so we could add support for other formats um, if they're worthwhile um, and widely supported in browsers. Um, like, I would say if like Firefox decided to add a new format, we would consider adding it. Um, especially if it was easy to add and didn't take a really long time to uh, compute. Like right. right now they're working with MozJPEG, but mm -hmm. MozJPEG is relatively slow to encode because it has sort of JPEG crush functionality where it tries lots and lots of values of parameters to try and find the best ones for that image, right, which right. is great if you are only going to do it once, but is not as good inside a web server. Maybe for build process or something. Yeah. Um, one last thing. What about responsive images? So I've obviously played with PageSpeed uh, a number of times, and the biggest hang-up that I've had in the past has been if I have a responsive images solution in place, say with picture fill, if I had regular static image tags, it does you know lazy loading or image optimization beautifully. Yeah. But if I'm using picture fill, nothing. Right. Um, do you guys have any insights on so, some things yeah. to try with that? So if you're, um, if whatever sort of system you're using has, um, if there's some attribute of some tag that you can say that contains an image, you can tell PageSpeed about that. You can okay. tell PageSpeed, here's a URL valued attribute, and specifically, semantically, it's an image. Mm -hmm. Then PageSpeed will treat that just like any other image tag and will optimize it. Is that, is that new? I, uh, I added it maybe like a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, it's, but that doesn't deal with source set, for example, mm -hmm. because source set is one attribute that contains multiple URLs and also stuff that aren't URLs. Right. Um, right. And you'd have to dive into that to actually get the bit of it that corresponds to an image. Um, so, if in if in the situation if if the thing you're using you have like I don't know a data source attribute mm -hmm. which is an alternate source, right. um, we can totally handle that. But if you're using the full source set with sizes and all that? Yeah, we, we can't do that and we'll need to add source set parsing capability at some point. Okay. We would like to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for the beaconing bit where you're figuring out if images are critical or not, mm -hmm. um, how do you figure out if it's like a phone, there's a different critical image versus a desktop? So we do a little bit of sort of fragmentation on this. So we uh, try and compare desktop versus mobile versus tablet. Um, but those are very fuzzy categories, so we also just sort of like err on the side of saying like, yeah, this is probably visible above the fold on enough screens that we should count it that way, even though it will be below the fold on the ones that are smaller in that class. And is that also like a page by page thing? Because like the footer. Yes, it's like all page by page. Oh, okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, What's the um, performance? <coughs> so uh, there are two options that we have. We use page. Page speed, or do you know, like code those optimizations ourselves in terms of figuring this out? Yeah. So, if for every page load in the production environment, if page speed is getting called, yeah. while page speed is trying to figure out, you know, okay, I, this library is being called, and now I have to do these things. What's the mm -hmm. performance hit on that page load? So, the the there sort of the main performance hit is when it first has to go through your whole site and like optimize all your images. Um, that's a that's something we can do in the background. Um, but that it, and and we sort of restrict it so we don't optimize too many at once. But that's something. But we can cache we can cache all that. Um, so that's not so bad. Um, the sort of ongoing performance hit is mostly that we have to parse all the HTML that flows through the system. Um, and we have a pretty fast HTML parser, but it still takes maybe ten milliseconds. Um, so if you have um, if you're doing something that like dynamically generates HTML in response to user queries, we're probably enough faster than that that it doesn't have much of an effect. But if you have a site that's all static HTML and you were previously like serving it cacheable or something, um, it's just completely static, um, you would notice it. 
We do, however, have um, a downstream caching um, option where, so normally if you just put like varnish or something in front of PageSpeed, it works great. It takes all of our, um, it takes all of our resources, which we've cache extended, and um, it can put them in the, it can put them in the cache. Um, they'll get cached there. It'll stay there for a very long time. For the most part, if you put any kind of cache in front of PageSpeed, PageSpeed just improves the efficiency of that cache. The there place where that's not true is HTML, okay. um, because by default, PageSpeed serves all HTML as uncacheable, because there's different HTML for different browsers and things. Um, if your HTML would be cacheable if not for PageSpeed, or you have some way to figure out whether it's cacheable based on some kind of key, um, then we have a downstream caching setup where we can um, give you some configuration to put into your uh, Varnish um, configuration that will uh, that will handle um, that PageSpeed does different sort of user agent dependent optimizations and also that it needs to deal with um, that it sometimes doesn't optimize everything on the first try. Um, and then if you do that, um, it has very, very little performance impact because almost no uh, queries are hitting it. So basically for the user, when they, when they first open a web page, until the page speed finishes doing it, they might see something for the first hit. And it's more, uh, and well, then, then On the first the hit, answer. the user will usually actually end up seeing the unoptimized page. Like right. if you've never gotten a hit on a page before and PageSpeed has to discover and optimize all the resources, it does that in the background and it just focuses at first and just get everything through, get everything out to the user. And then, um, so the user won't really see that hit. Um, the, in the background, we'll be optimizing the images so you'll notice that like your CPU utilization will go up and if you were close to running out of CPU utilization, you might have a problem. Okay, okay. And uh, so primarily the product that we have has most of the pages, are, like 99% of the pages are dynamic pages. It's always fetching new data based yep. on the user that's yep. logging in and trying to figure that out. So in that scenario, does, like because PageSpeed does not have much, you know, uh, much of an impact there, uh, it, 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 does it really make sense? Because it doesn't have much images. It's primarily CSS, CSS, CSS all the while. So I mean, there's still like a bit of optimization you can do with that. So, um, but I mean, so one thing you could do with the experiment framework is you could turn on PageSpeed and you could do an on versus off experiment and see what happened. Okay. So, um, for those speed speed options that are, uh, you know, you want us to roll up our sleeves and configure, all right, is there any possibly robotic advice or profiling help or whatever saying, hey, this might, this option might uh, fire help out for your website? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> so, for the most part, um, if something is easy to automate, we automated it. Right. And if it's hard to automate, we've sort of left it as a configurable option. Right. And we have documentation that talks about sort of like when you would want different ones. Right. Um, with most of them, it's a matter of you turn it on with a query parameter. You make sure it doesn't break your site. You test various things that you think um, are especially fragile on your site. And then you roll it out and see if anyone complains. Or you go through your queuing process. Do you think this might? help your typical WordPress site? Yeah, it does very well with WordPress. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw that you had IIS on your list of <laughs> yep. web servers. So did you guys actually work with Microsoft to get it in there? And no, it's, it's all community based. Yeah, so, so there's <coughs> a guy, um, uh, Otto, in the Netherlands, who, um, uh, with another guy, runs a company called Weam. And they ported the software to IIS. And um, they sell that. Uh, we have like an ads, like an ad-supported one at the bottom of the page or something. If you want to just try it out or something like that. Yes. Do you just keep concatenating the right, left, the names of the uh, images for the sprite? Mm -hmm. Still uh, ongoing or? So <laughs> yeah. So okay. So the reason that we have to put the names of the original images into the URL is that if something goes wrong and we get a request for a URL that isn't in our cache, we need to be able to reconstruct it, um, or else we'll break the page. Um, so for example, one place this might happen is someone could install PageSpeed, and they could install it on two servers. That, like, there's, they have a load balancer, so they have two servers, and they install it on their backend servers, and they don't have them share a cache. In general, if you have two servers with PageSpeed, they should share a cache. Um, but let's say they don't. Um, this would, um, one server could get the request for the HTML, optimize it, put it in the cache, 
the other, then you could get a request in for the image that goes to the other server, and we would say, we don't know what this image is, we can't generate it. Or, if our cache is at capacity, we might affect something. And um, we might get a request in for something that, like, um, depending on what cache you're using, maybe your cache um, is, uh, let's say, it evicts things that were least recently created. Um, we could keep serving something, and then it gets, it's hot, but we're doing least recently created. So eventually it gets evicted, and it might get evicted right after we serve it. Um, so we need to be, have a way to recreate it from the URL. Uh, almost all of our filters and all of our default filters are able to recover in this situation. But couldn't you like encode it somehow? Uh, it seems like you would maybe like base64 encode it, and it might be like not as long as you So it, base64 encoding makes things longer. You'd have to concat gzip then base64. And you probably say three percent. I mean, yeah. <laughs> There's trade-offs to all, all all the different approaches. Yeah, I mean, another thing we could do is um, if we were to give up on the multi-server environment thing, we could have another cache that was just sort of like a mapping from um, here was an output image, this is what its inputs were, and just like not clear that cache because that cache would be tiny. Um, but we also want to support the multi-server environment. Thing. Sorry, when you say multi-server environment. Or you, or you. Okay, so if you have a load balancer and you have two servers behind that load balancer, you yeah. install PHP on both of them. That's supported. Yeah. Um, ideally, you have them share a cache. Mm -hmm. um, and then if one of them does an optimization, the other one will be able to see it. Mm -hmm. So if um, the HTML is served by one of them, it optimizes an image in the background, it's stored in its cache, it serves out HTML that references that optimized image. And then the request for the optimized image gets load balanced to the other server. It needs to be able to respond to that. Mm -hmm. and ideally, it can look in a shared cache, but it might have to regenerate it. And a situation where you wouldn't be able to share a cache is if you have like one data center in Taiwan and one data center in California. Mm -hmm. And your request went to California the first time and then it goes to Taiwan the second time because the network is weird. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to break the page. Yeah. So where, did, where does that shared cache work? Um, so if they have access, so it can be a shared file cache, it can be a shared memcache. Yeah. Um, you so if you did a memcache, you'd have to configure memcache yourself and tell them how, where to find it. If you had a file cache, um, you just have to have some directory they both have access to. Um, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I, I gather you're very technical. Is there anybody in the group that's doing anything to get this more widely accepted by commercial hosts and supporting it? Uh, yeah, um, we've talked to a bunch of um, commercial hosts. Um, so, for example, uh, GoDaddy and DreamHost um, both let you turn on PageSpeed. On DreamHost, there's just a little checkbox. On GoDaddy, you have to put something in your HTTP access file. Um, and Edgecast is a CDN that supports PageSpeed. Um, and yeah, we've been talking to different people. Who, um, we're always excited about doing new integrations. So what's next for you? Uh, so I'm working on um, trying to make, trying to change something in our internal flow that makes it easier for us to accept open source contributions, um, which is a kind of minor technical thing, but I think will be really helpful. Um, right now, we can only accept open source contributions to some parts of our code base, and I'm making there be more and more parts where we can do that. Um, also, I think we're going to move to GitHub. Um, Currently, we're on code.google.com, and we did our engine export on GitHub and got a bunch more community involvement. So it seems like GitHub is more the place to be for things like this. So. Um, there's also people on the team working on new rewriters, um, but I'm working more on the infrastructure side of things, so I'm less up on what they're doing. Um, does this does this module talk back to the Google mothership at all? We... Uh, by default, no. By default, it beacons nothing back. Um, there are a few things you can do that would make it talk to Google. So, for example, I talked about in experiments, you can have it report back to a Google Analytics account. Um, you can also turn on uh, JavaScript library canonicalization. So, for example, if you have a jQuery <laughs> hosted on your site, um, it's if you turn on this filter, it would rewrite your jQuery URL to be ajax.googleapis.com slash jQuery version whatever. And then the goal of this is that if everyone does this, um, then it's more likely to be in cache. 
Um, but the downside of that is that Google sees this request. So um, if you want to keep things more private from Google, you shouldn't turn that on. Um, can you use any sort of regular expressions just to say, like, send these URLs but not send these other ones? You may suppose you have like, some private data, you just don't want these pages, other URL patterns to be shared. Well, those wouldn't be shared anyway. Sorry? Those wouldn't be shared. Sorry. Um, with the with the uh, canonicalized JavaScript, what happens is we ship a, a file that says, if the JavaScript, after minification, hashes to this, that's a file you can get on Google. So if you have your own private JavaScript, it won't get sent to Google, because it won't hash to an ID we knew. And even if it did hash to an ID we knew, like a very unlikely hash collision, it would just end up substituting the wrong JavaScript file. But we're using like a 22-bit hash, so a hash collision is very unlikely. I guess I'm just confused what data gets shared with Google. Uh, by default, I nothing. Like URL code, uh, HTML code, code would be sure. It's it's all internal on your server. Or whatever it runs your on server your server, right. yeah. Um, this is an open source module that runs. So if you're running Apache, then you're oh, running yeah, Apache yeah, yeah. plus mod page speed. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to talk to Google at all. Okay. So I'm just curious if you already have a workflow in place. If you're using Grunt or Gulp, and you are doing a lot of the low hanging fruit type of opt optimizations. Mm -hmm. The, like the, the first half of your, your, your uh, presentation, all that stuff, you know, at least a, a normal <coughs> workflow takes care of. What would you recommend focusing on if all that low hanging fruit has already been taken care of? You know, is, is it more focusing on running experiments to see with these other types of uh, optimizations what, uh, you know, user conversions end up being? What, what so, I mean, it may be that you are already in a good enough place where it's not useful enough to justify the running something else. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, it could be that if you have page speed, then you can stop running your other optimizers, um, and that might make your life easier. Right. Um, if you, um, I, I would, I would suggest checking out deferred JavaScript, um, mm -hmm. depending on how your site is set up. If your JavaScript is just for progressive enhancement, um, this can have a really big effect in how quickly your page loads. Okay, I, I know, like already doing critical path, you know. In line JS, just the bare necessities at the top, and then. Sounds like you're in a pretty good shape. Yeah, I figure. <laughs> so, how do some of these image optimizations work for images that lie on CDNs, for example? So, um, we work with uh, pull CDNs. So, if the way it works is that your image is stored on your origin server, and there's a CDN that's configured to, when a request comes in, it serves it from cache. If it's not in cache, it requests it from your origin server and then caches it. In that situation, we work, uh, we work fine. Um, what happens is uh, you have to tell us that um, if it sees a reference to cdn.example.com, that it's actually totally fine to, for analysis purposes and optimization purposes, to fetch that from origin. Um, then, uh, then it will all work. Um, if you're a push CDN, we don't support that. Well, like if you serve some things from S3, we don't support that. In case uh, you know you tell it to fetch it from origins to the yeah. CDN, then you're basically losing the advantage of the CDN. No, 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 you're not. So um, the users will still fetch from the from the CDN. It's just what the web server does. So so when PageSpeed, for example, sees in your HTML, it sees uh, you've got an image. Okay, it needs to fetch that image and optimize it, and then include a reference to that image in the HTML that has the cache extended optimized version. Okay. So um, it, when it fetches that, it needs to know where to fetch it from. And it needs to know that when it writes it out into the HTML, um, it will be able to be interpreted. So for example, um, if you had, imagine you have um, an image that, like, I don't know, let's imagine you're just like, hot linking something, and it's on someone else's site, and they're not running PageSpeed. Um, you could tell PageSpeed, when you see this, it's OK for you to fetch it and optimize it. And PageSpeed would fetch it, it would optimize it, it would store it in its cache, and it would serve out a link to a page speed version of that. So it would be like uh, foo dot, it would be like othersite.com slash foo.jpg.pagespeed.hash, okay? And then the user's browser would try and fetch it from that other site, which is not a CDN, and that site would say, I don't know what this URL is, it's a 404. So there's two pieces here. There's that page speed needs to be able to find the URL to optimize it, and there's that page speed needs to be able to uh, write out the URL in a way that the browser will be able to get to it. And with a Pull CDN, um, the second part is already taken care of. If PageSpeed writes out anything that references cdn.example.com, 
Um, the browser will go to cdn.example.com, it won't be in cache, it'll go to www, it'll be stored in cache, all the other references will be good. Um, and so PageSpeed just needs to know that it's okay for it to optimize the stuff on cdn.example.com. So it'll, it'll, hand, it'll allow you to have both the JavaScript and the CSS on CDNs also? Yep. Yeah. JavaScript, CSS, images, basically any resource that PageSpeed can rewrite um, can be stored on CDN. Now, if I remember correctly, can't you have PageSpeed do its optimizations to your CDN hosted JavaScript, for example, and then can't it put the optimized version back onto the CDN for references, or does it have to still be cached locally on the server? So, um, it is, it, it does end up accessible through the CDN, um, but, it, but, but it does need to be stored in the server's cache. Okay. Um, so it gets stored in both caches. Gotcha. Um, it needs to be stored in the server's cache. So, for example, um, when it's rewriting the HTML, it has to know whether the whether it has a cached version of that image to write into the HTML. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you could do something fancier here, where you keep some of the stuff in cache and you purge the other stuff because you figure it gets once you think it's in your CDN, CDN. cache. Yeah. Um, but we don't do that. Okay. How often do you need to purge the uh, so ideally you never purge the cache, it should just work. Um, a case where you might need to purge it is so Mod PageSpeed respects origin cache lifetimes. So um, if you have a JavaScript file on your site and you uh, currently say this is cacheable for a day, okay? Mod PageSpeed will see the reference to the JavaScript, it'll fetch the JavaScript, and it will store it in Mod PageSpeed's cache of the JavaScript, and it will think that it's valid for a day. And it will serve out references to the user um, that are valid for a year. And um, it knows that as soon as uh, the JavaScript changes in its cache, it can start re serving out different references. But maybe you have a problem with your JavaScript, and you need it to refresh more often than that. Um, you might need to purge PageSpeed's cache uh, either entirely, or if you want, you can purge it for a specific URL. Um, and then PageSpeed would, refre would refetch it. In general, when you turn on PageSpeed, you can reduce your origin cache lifetimes because um, the cost of PageSpeed fetching it once and then caching it, like, in general, it'd be bad to serve like a CSS file with a one minute cache lifetime because then everyone out there basically gets no effective caching. Um, but if PageSpeed has to refetch the CSS file once a minute, that's not that bad. Um, but you can actually do even better than this. So if, it turn, if you have some stuff on your site that is completely static, you can tell PageSpeed, and it's, it's static and it's also <coughs> um, not have to be fetched over HTTP. It has like no permissions issues and it's fine for PageSpeed to just read it straight from the file system. Um, you can tell PageSpeed to load resources from file, um, which is super fast and they'll always be fresh. Because uh, it can treat that just like a file cache. It just stats it and see if there was a change. Are there any trade-offs to doing that approach? Uh, it will, so they're, they're not, there aren't trade-offs, they're just restrictions where it applies. So mm -hmm. it only works if the files are on your local disk, mm -hmm. if it's okay for them to be completely public and like you don't have access controls, or if you do have access controls, they're on your HTML. Right. Um, like we can't check cookies because that would just get skipped. Mm -hmm. um, they have to, uh, and they have to be completely static. Um, if you had uh, a CSS file that was generated with a server site include, um, PageSpeed would just spit out the um, surface so right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you can control that with like saying this particular directory is static. Um, you can control it by saying um, by, by blacklists, by regexes. It's pretty configurable. Okay. Now, in a multi-server environment, suppose you have something like uh, HA proxy load balancer and Apache in front of that, you get away with having PageSpeed run only on the Apache on the front. So you, you, you could do that, yeah. Um, it might be that you have so much traffic that um, one web server is not enough to handle all of that, and you might need to put uh, mod PageSpeed on your backends. Um, I mean, at some point, you could get to a level of traffic that PP just can't handle, and then you need to shard it. So with the image scrolling, I got like two monitors. One's vertical, one's horizontal. So if I load up a web page on a vertical monitor, would, where does it know the fold? I mean, is it? It's just uh, empirically. Like, it tried it on a whole bunch of browsers, and if your page is 
taller than 99% of browsers will probably get it wrong. And what will happen is that image at the bottom will take a little longer to load um, because PageSpeed will have to realize, oh, this image is actually visible after all, and go fetch it. Okay. All right. But it will load. You don't it will have load. To actually... Yes. Okay. Yes. It doesn't have to wait for you to scroll or something. Uh, it will load. It'll just uh, slow down the image loading instead of speeding it up. One last question. This seems like a great idea, but are there any use cases where you can use this? this so if your server is very resource constrained, if it's running like really close to its limit, um, it's going to push you over its limit. Okay. Um, if, you're, if your server um, is already very well optimized and you don't need any of the changes page is making, like you may be in that situation, yeah. um, if you're already doing all of this stuff manually and you already have an existing process, there's no real point in running page speed. Um, it's another thing to break. Um, it's very reliable and secure, but like I mean, we have had security vulnerabilities. We have had um, situations where uh, we're not as efficient as we should be, and we think that's all fixed. But like stuff can go wrong, so um, it's generally good to have as few parts in your system as you can. So that's another reason to exclude it. I think in general the benefits of running it are, are enough to outweigh that, um, but that is that is sort of the general downside of adding another dependency to your system. Uh, as three, you said you don't support it um, and that type of thing. Is it because you never will, or you just haven't yet? Or? So the case that we don't support S3 is the one where you like have images which you put on S3, and then you reference those images and you want to um, and you want PageSpeed to optimize those. To support S3, what we have to do is you have to see you're referencing an image on S3. We have to fetch that image. That's easy. O optimize it. We already know how to do that. But then we have to take our optimized image. We have to push into S3, and we haven't done that integration. Um, if someone, if that. someone like contributed something to do yeah. that, we could. Um, but we haven't looked at that at all. Mm -hmm. um, the downside of it is you have to like a pull CDN. They're all the same. They all use this nice HTTP um, uh, caching semantics. Very easy. Um, we can write it once. It works for everyone. Um, for every different uh, file host, we'd have to do another custom integration. And maybe the S3 is big enough that like it's worth doing. And I think if someone submitted a patch that did this well, I'd be happy to review it. Um, well, like, does it support Google Cloud? No. Okay. I mean, uh, I'd probably support S3 before Google Cloud because it's just not that common for people to do this uh, with Google Cloud. Like, from my experience, um, I, was using a, I was using S3 with, with CloudFront. End of the day, it made sense to put certain assets on S3, you know, and just let let it do its thing with our automated process. And then other things that we did want PageSpeed to do its own optimizations for, we just localized. Um, but that we we had control over the build process, so we could we could differentiate between the two different groups. It, it really depends. Uh, I mean, if it's easy for you to use a full CDN, then everything will just work. Um, and if it's a lot of work because you're currently using a push CDN um, and you have some time to write <laughs> change for us and we're curious to see it. What would you work on yourself if you weren't constrained by time? Like magic. <laughs> I really want to add source set support because um, I got this retina display and it's very spiffy and um, I have all of these images and the images actually, so I said the images weren't optimized, they are optimized because we have this thing uh, where we can optimize images in place. Um, but images that we optimize in place, um, we can't do the right job with caching, because we can't long cache them, because that requires changing the URL. Um, so uh, we can still optimize images um, in that situation, but uh, we have to shorten the cache lifetime uh, relative to what we could do. So I'd really like to add source set support. That wouldn't take all of my information. Yeah, to be honest, that's, that's the one killer thing. That it's like, oh, I, I'm using picture fill. It's the only thing that it doesn't do out of the box. And um, with handling high re you know, high resolution, high DPI devices, it's it's the next new thing to overcome. Yeah. Is that it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.